And so, go ahead, you can start. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. Um, before I start, I just want to say, if you guys get hungry, you're more than welcome to go back there and get some samples of the food. Um, the salad should probably be eaten <laughs> sooner rather than later, just because it's fresher now. So, um, well, why we're we here. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the plant-based diet and juicing. And just a little bit about me. Oh, I need the clicker, huh? Here we go. All right. A little bit about me. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Toxicology, and I did work at the California EPA Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment for, for a little while um, before moving up to Idaho. I had my own, long ago, I had my own essential oil um, testing um, thing that I did. I had an incubator and petri dishes and I tested, you know, the essential oils for how well they could kill bacteria and made my own hand sanitizer, things like that. Um, had my own products for a little while. Then I also worked with Health Freedom Idaho and I've donated my time to some other nonprofit organizations. I've done podcast interviews, presentations like this, and I have worked as a paralegal for an attorney. I have a few websites that would be good to know about. Vaccine.guide is a big compilation of research on mostly childhood vaccines. Um, and there's no commentary on that site. It's just published medical research, um, you know, screenshots from the CDC website and links to all of these things, all of these resources or from the vaccine manufacturers themselves and certain things, certain points that are highlighted so that you can see for yourself some of the information that we're not always given. So there's that. And then thinklovehealthy.com is a, one of my first ventures a while back. There's some good information on there as well, mostly about vaccines and childhood vaccines. Um, and then there's Everly Report, which is more, I started that when COVID came around. <clears throat> so it's more focused on that. And then this last link has, it contains all of my links, basically. All of my social media accounts, um, and links to interviews I've done and etc. So, all right, so just wanted to give you an idea of what my degree means. Uh, when it comes to the study of environmental toxicology, it's not just looking at the environment, it's looking at how toxins in our environment can affect ecosystems and biological systems like the human body, the liver, all the organs, how we detoxify them, etc. And so, I just want to emphasize that you know my my area of expertise is in what can harm the body, how does it harm the body, and all of that. So, why did I become interested in health and nutrition? Well, uh, in my twenties, I developed severe anemia, Hashimoto's, which is thyroid autoimmunity, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and a digestive disorder that was no one diagnosed it. I had dry, pale skin, like very severely dry. Uh, eczema, cystic acne, very bad hormonal cystic acne, painful. Cysts in my joints affecting my mobility and my strength. My hair was falling out. I've always had thicker hair in general, but man, it was bad. Um, I had pain in my chest upon waking could not wake up in the morning uh, before 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And even then I just felt so sluggish. I felt, I felt like I had this weight on my chest. Um, and this was all in my twenties. So I had, at, some, at one point I ended up having the inability to form healthy bowel movements. I developed fissures. If you know what that is, it's like trying to pass glass, shards of glass. Okay, when going to the bathroom. I mean, it was a nightmare. Okay, so <laughs> not so I was dependent on Miralax, that little part right there. I was taking it every single day for two years of my life. So, <clears throat> and then also on top of that, I was, like I said, severe anemia. I had severe anemia. I was lightheaded much the majority of the time. I had little kids and I'm trying to bend down and pick up their toys. And 
I would have to bend down like this to pick up a toy it's because if I move my head down below my chest, I would immediately start blacking out, head would start pounding, and I have to hold on to something. Okay, so it was that. Everyone around me, you know, would probably have thought I was okay. You know, they wouldn't have really noticed too much except for the, you know, external features, but, you know, I had a lot going on. So in addition to that, my son was vaccine injured. He had all the signs and symptoms of autism on a mild to moderate level. He had, you know, primarily issues with his gut. He had the eczema. He had, gosh, neurological issues, a lot going on with him too. And then also my husband had ulcerative colitis as bad as it possibly could be when he was 18. And so he kind of had to figure that out and deal with that. And he was on meds for a long time. Um, actually one thing just to note that helped him tremendously was taking super high doses of probiotics every day. So, so moving on. When you're trying to find a path to health, there's so many things to cover. You know, there's diet like we're going to get into tonight, but it's tough because one of the things, it's one of the last things you want to change, really. It's easier to change things like what you're using on your skin or your household cleaning products or what you're using on your lawn and maybe getting a little bit more, you know, exercise and all of that. Uh, it's a lot harder to change your diet. And I went through like this whole list of things practically before I ended up deciding, okay, okay, finally, I'm going to have to do something with my diet because I don't want to go the medical system route. I don't want to just take, you know, some kind of drug to cover up the symptoms and not actually get to the root cause. So, but when it comes to diet, what do we do? Yeah. There's, oh, <laughs> there's, you know, all these different types of diets that people are promoting and the amount of information out there is overwhelming. We are absolutely saturated with conflicting information on diet and nutrition these days. So what do we do to make sense of it? I'm sure you've all seen this, right? I've seen people who are saying, I'm healing on carnivore. Keto is amazing. All of these things, you know. Um, so why plant-based? You know, well, let's define it. A plant-based diet is a diet consisting mostly of plants, you know, fruits, veggies, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, legumes, grains, typically 80% or more. So it's not necessarily vegetarian. It's not necessarily vegan, gluten-free, soy-free, even whole food or organic. Some people, you know, they say I'm plant-based, but they still eat a lot of processed foods. So the nice thing about plant-based is that it is pretty flexible. Um, you can be high carb or low carb, high fat, low fat, high protein, low protein. Um, there's people who are fruitarian, they eat a lot of fruit. And there's people who eat a lot of raw foods, mostly raw and less cooked foods. <clears throat> so yeah, why should we choose plant-based as a diet? Well, we all know that fruits and vegetables are good for you, basically. You know, we've heard that. I mean, that's just been what is for decades and decades and centuries, we've known that fruits and vegetables are good for you. Even before the FDA, the CDC, all of these people, even in the Bible, you have Daniel eating vegetables and being healthier than the rest of the other king's men, if you know that story. It's an interesting story. So, but let's just look at what we actually are as a species. I don't really want to get into all of the research on why fruits and vegetables are good for you, why other things are bad for you and all that. I'm going to get into a little bit of that, but most of that I would guess you've probably heard before. So I don't want to go with that direction with this. So here you see, you know, we're just looking at the mouse here, but are we carnivores? Are we omnivores? Are we herbivores? Are we frugivores? What are we? Let's look at the human species, okay? We are, first and foremost, the only creature on Earth that cooks their food and is confused about what we should eat, okay? Like, there aren't really any other animals that, I think, gosh, is this good for me, you know? So, our teeth. So you saw that picture um, back there. Our teeth 
have blunted spade-like canines, which are technically, you know, they're, they're pretty blunted. You know, they're, they're more spade-like. Um, but we don't have long curved fangs like true carnivores. We just don't. You know, not like the cats, like the big cats. <laughs> so, um, you know, and we also have molars in our teeth that are indicative of herbivory. So eating plants. Um, let's, I'll just go back to this one. We have jaw muscles that are designed for extensive chewing and masticating. So we have this side to side movement. Cats and carnivores do not do this. Their jaws can't do that at all. Um, and we also have this forward mobility going back and forth, jutting out our jaw forward and back. Um, our hands, we have prehensile hands grasping with opposable thumbs, right? Carnivores typically have paws. Uh, we don't have paws or claws. We have flattened nails, right? And hands are kind of perfect for picking fruit, just in general, you know? Our vision is designed to see in full color as opposed to most carnivores, which actually have like a more grayscale. Um, dogs and cats in particular, you, you, when they see, everything's kind of more grayed out. Um, and what's helpful, like I said, it's helpful for seeing whether or not fruits are ripe. That's one, uh, one thing that's good about having good vision. Um, our taste receptors as humans have a heightened sensitivity to fruit sugar. Carnivores do not have a heightened sensitivity to fruit sugar when it comes to their taste buds. Also, I mean, this could be a potentially, you know, learned behavior or an, a behavior that is, you know, kind of been um, over the years weaned out of us. I don't know how to explain that, but most humans don't salivate at the sight of like a rabbit, you know, like a, like a dead rabbit or something. We're not like, oh yeah, you know, like that's not what most of us do. Okay. All right, this one I, I might have to apologize for ahead of time. I should have said that. But this is just kind of a fascinating thing to me. This is the Paku fish native to the Amazon River. They are related to the meat-eating piranha, except they are omnivorous with vegetative tendencies. They eat primarily fruit that has, and the fruit seeds, which have dropped from the trees into the river. Okay, that's what they evolved to do, which is absolutely fascinating. Actually, at the Boy, aquarium of Boise, they have these fish there. Paku, yeah. Or baby Paku, I'm not totally sure. Um, and so the next the next picture is a little bit disturbing. I'm just gonna... Um, that one. <laughs> That's their teeth. Okay, what does that look like? It's, yeah, I mean, it looks like human teeth. It's very disturbing almost, you know, on a fish of all things. So <laughs> it's a fish. That's a fish. It's a fish that eats fruit. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. So um, more information about the human species, right? We have long digestive tracts compared to our body length. That's an important um, measurement because Carnivores have relatively short digestive tract lengths compared to their body length. And part of that is fiber. Fiber is critical for proper digestive tract function in humans. There's this thing called peristalsis, and it's basically our digestive tract goes like this and squeezes the food along our digestive tract. And if the food you're eating does not have fiber, it will not do this. And so we have this really long digestive tract. And if you're not having fiber, you know, making that process happen, it's, it's going to sit in there until you eat something that pushes the rest of it along. Okay. Whereas carnivores do not need fiber for their guts to work properly. Um, our liver makes all the cholesterol that we need. And true carnivores actually, you know, Cholesterol has been linked to atherosclerosis, which is plaque in the arteries. Um, and typically in the past, that has been linked to meat consumption. And what's fascinating is that true carnivores cannot develop atherosclerosis. They can't. It, they have to tweak their genes 
in order to get them to develop it. It doesn't matter how much, you know, obviously they eat meat. That's all they do. But there's something in their bodies, in their, their DNA, that helps prevent that from happening. Um, okay. So, um, one thing that's interesting is when we eat plant sources of vitamin A, like carotenoids from carrots and sweet potatoes and leafy greens, um, this, we can drink carrot juice. You know, we're going to be doing juice later. You can juice 10 pounds of carrots and drink that juice all in one day. And the amount of carotenoids in that juice is super high, but you cannot be poisoned by that. If you were to eat liver with the amount of vitamin A that's in liver and eat a lot of it, you can actually poison your liver based on how much vitamin A is in that liver. So there's carotenoids, which are pro-vitamin A. Our bodies use that to create vitamin A, retinol. The retinol, the vitamin A that's in animals is already preformed. It's already in retinol form. So when we get too much vitamin A that's preformed, we actually increase our risk of bone fracture and there is vitamin A toxicity at, you know, it can be a problem as well. Um, one other thing is that humans do not synthesize uricase. It's an enzyme that is required to break down uric acid from animal products, uh, especially organ meats like liver. And uric acid can cause gout and other issues. Um, if you didn't know, I'm sure you do, we originated near the equator in tropical regions where plant foods are abundant and temperatures are suitable for survival, survival all year round. We don't have dense fur to survive in cold regions where plant foods are scarce and we would have to be dependent on animal foods. There are few biological or anatomical traits which equip us to efficiently hunt and prey or hunt and kill prey animals. Okay, we have to create tools, work with other humans potentially, and have weapons of some sort for this purpose in order to hunt. Therefore, based on just our innate instincts, our anatomical, biological traits, the practice of hunting animals for food is pretty much a learned behavior that was necessitated for survival. Um, particularly particularly for humans in colder climates, rather than based on natural human design. So um, when it comes to our species specific diet, our closest animal or mammal relatives, you know, I'm not trying to preach evolution here, but just based on DNA alone, we do share 99.6% of our DNA um, with two different species of chimpanzees, the common chimps and the bonobos. Now, they are both frugivorous primates, meaning they eat primarily fruit. Now, DNA is the blueprint for the structure and function of our cells, how our tissues and organs and systems develop and heal, along with the constant internal communication and signaling process between our cells. So the chimpanzee's diet is made up of 60% fruits or more. The rest is seeds, nuts, leaves, stems, flowers, honey, medicinal plants, soil, insects, insects, meats, and eggs. But meat typically accounts for less than 2% of a chimp's diet, uh, but at times it can account for up to 6%. However, chimps, this, uh, several studies on this is very interesting, chimps will confine their diets almost exclusively to ripe fruits when they are abundant and are considered ripe fruit specialists. They won't eat unripe fruit. It's very interesting. They would rather eat the pith of an orange than eat an unripe orange. So, okay, so based on all of that, my personal, after doing all the research that I've done, I, my conclusion is that humans are likely to be primarily frugivorous. Okay, there's still that 0.4% difference in our DNA, of course. There's, it's obvious we're very different from chimps in many ways, but when it comes to our digestive tract and everything, um, our, our hands, our teeth, our eyes, everything, it just kind of makes sense. So, and then I wanted to include this interesting verse from the Bible, okay, if any of you are Christian or care about that. 
uh, from Genesis 1, 28 through 30. It says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. It, and then God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Okay, there's nothing in here that says meat or animals. It says that we shall rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds. But he's pretty, God's pretty specific about what we're going to be eating here. Okay, so the next slide. Um, so why does this make sense? Why does fruit eating as the majority of our diet make sense and just plants in general? Fruit is suitable for our taste buds right off the plant. Picking fruit does not kill the plant. Actually, and eating it, it doesn't kill the plant. It actually propagates the plant. Animals that eat fruit, you know, they will have bowel movements. The seeds will go into the ground. It'll start a new plant. It's pretty awesome, actually, for God to, whoops, sorry, for God to have designed it that way. I think it's pretty interesting and awesome. We don't have to soak or ferment or cook fruit for it to be good for us for it to taste good. We don't have to add any seasonings, we don't have to add salt, we don't have to do any of that. It's awesome, you know, right from the get-go as long as it's ripe, right? Um, it contains water for hydration, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals. There's a lot of foods that don't hydrate you at all. Um, it's pretty ideal for the human digestive tract when it comes to different foods that we can eat. When it comes to whole foods, not pro processed foods can be pretty quick to digest because they're already so broken down uh, from its original form. But when it comes to whole foods, fruit, it takes, it's the quickest for our bodies to digest. Almost as if our digestive tract was made to process fruit, right? So it's also the closest whole food to fasting. And fasting is incredibly important for regeneration of our tissues. And of course, natural fruit sugar is quick energy for, for us. Okay, but humans are biologically designed to adapt for survival as well. So, and then here's the after the flood verse from the Bible. It says, the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky, everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. So a couple of notes about this. God's original design was not necessarily to eat animals. If we're talking about, you know, if we're believing the Bible as our... I, I don't know what anyone else believes in here, so I'm just, you know. But I think it's fascinating because it just hints at what our original design may have been, as well as what happened after the flood. Okay, you've got Noah and his family and animals, and maybe, you know, maybe they saved some other fruits and vegetables and grain or whatever, but there's probably not a lot growing after the entire earth is covered in a flood, let's say, all right? So it almost necessitated meat eating at that point, right? So that's why this verse makes sense to me when it comes to the flood and everything. But anyway, so yes, humans have adaptations. Our intelligence, our creative faculties have enabled us to migrate and survive in climates and environments we would not naturally inhabit. And the human body can adapt relatively well to various diets, but not typically without affecting proper function, vitality, or longevity. Um, but there are some, you know, we can kind of do this and teeter-totter with our bodies and our digestive tract and our microbiome and everything in order to try to make the best of what we are eating. I mean, that's why so many people can survive on processed food for so long. You know what I mean? So um, our dietary changes can actually affect our DNA expression, which is how our bodies use our DNA. Um, and the dietary changes that we have now can have lasting effects on following generations. So if I were to eat a lot of meat and I'm getting a lot of preformed vitamin A, and this is actually something that a lot of, um, a lot of people have this particular DNA mutation where they don't convert carotenoids very well to 
retinol, the vitamin A that we need to use as vitamin A. And that is in part due to the fact that their ancestors, the generations before them, were eating a lot more vitamin A from animal products, and so their bodies didn't need to. It's a loss of function over time. That's actually what it is. And so it can be difficult for some people who are going from meat to plants, if they cut it off dramatically, if they try to go overnight, you know, and cut out meat, they might suffer a little bit for that. So, but we'll talk about that a little bit more um, at the end. So like I said, our body attempts to make many adjustments for shifts in dietary consumption. Um, and, you know, based on um, if, if we're not eating an ideal diet, then the body, like I said, is going to try to make the best of that. So something else um, that we get when we eat meat. Okay, so we increase our carnitine and choline intake when we eat meat. Um, and this influences microbiome shifts in the digestive tract. It actually can increase bacteria that produce harmful compounds that is related and linked to atherosclerosis in several studies. Therefore, the kidneys try to balance that out by excreting greater amounts of carnitine. So the body is always trying to say, oh my gosh, okay, we've got this coming in and it's affecting this over here. We really don't want to absorb that, but we are absorbing that. We've got to try to get rid of it because we don't want this imbalance that's going on. So there's a little bit of that that happens. Higher meat consumption also um, when it comes to red meat most often. It does affect other species of gut bacteria, which can in turn um, alter immune system function, lead to inflammation, heart disease, even MS, and et cetera, many other chronic illnesses. So. So has anyone heard of the blue zones? Okay. The blue zones uh, were named for regions of the world where there are the highest numbers of living centenarians. So individuals who are 100 years and over. They were discovered by scientists who were studying longevity. And some of the regions are Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Costa Rica, Greece, and actually Loma Linda, California. Um, these people have a lot in common in these different regions, not just diet, but we're going to focus on diet. So on average, they are 95% whole food plant-based. So lots of fruits, greens, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans, some whole grains, but actually a lot of yams and sweet potatoes too. Aside from fish, which is actually eaten more regularly in the blue zones, they do have small amounts of cooked meats and they eat those about five times per month. But they only eat about two ounces or less at a time, which is the size of a deck of cards. Which doesn't seem like a lot compared to what we're used to eating here in America. And the animals used for meat are free ranging, exceptionally healthy animals, not like Unfortunately, the meat products from the animals, you know, that you would get in the stores typically. Um, and they do have about two to four eggs total per week and pretty much no dairy at all. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't. That's all that right there. Okay. So let's talk about protein because a lot of people, when they think of plant-based diets, in their minds, they're like, well, where are you going to get your protein from? Um, we definitely need to balance our intake of protein to maintain muscle mass as we age. But the more protein that we get, it also affects our kidney health. And our kidney health declines as we age as well. So this is the balance that we really need to have when we're talking about protein. Too much protein can actually cause your kidneys to reroute waste back into your bloodstream rather than excrete it out into your urine. And this can also upset the calcium balance in your body. Okay, so kidneys are supposed to filter out waste. If we're not filtering out waste, it's accumulating in the body. And this causes chronic illness to progress much faster. Doesn't mean you're gonna have symptoms right away. Um, there are certain diets that can actually suppress your immune system from being triggered to even develop chronic illness, but 
moving on. Okay. Uh, animal products contain ample amounts of preformed proteins. So uh, proteins are made up of amino acids, probably already know that, but the uh, amino acids in animal products are already um, bound together and folded. And so when we eat protein from animal products, our body has to expend energy to break it down into those in individual amino acids to actually be utilized. And animal products are good for getting all of the essential amino acids. That's one good thing about them. Um, plants contain less, typically contain a lot less protein than animal products, but in the form of amino acids rather than preformed protein. So our bodies do not need to go through the process of unfolding and breaking down into individual amino acids when we eat protein from plants. So contrary to popular belief, you actually can get more than enough protein on a plant-based diet, even if you don't eat any animal products. Um, all you really have to do is eat whole foods and get a, a variety of um, whole foods. So nuts, lentils, and beans are good sources of protein, um, but really even fruits contain a little bit of amino acids. Aside from soy, buckwheat, and buckwheat though, quinoa is a complete protein, which means it contains every single amino acid. Most plants do not contain every amino acid that is essential that we need to take in. So um, just a study quote from a study that kind of supports um, the fact that we can get enough protein on a plant-based diet. Basically, um, yeah, protein-rich foods such as legumes, beans, nuts, and seeds are sufficient to achieve full protein adequacy in adults consuming vegetarian vegan diets, while the question of any amino acid deficiency has been substantially overstated. So anytime you hear people say, oh, you can't get enough protein, um, it's just it's just not really true. It's kind of something that's been said and people just believe, but it's not true. So... But uh, this other Harvard Medical, School, Harvard Medical School study, they found that substituting 3% of calories from animal protein with plant protein instead was linked to a 12% reduced risk of dying from heart disease. And this was a study over a 32-year period. This is a pretty decent study. So has anyone heard of anti-nutrients? No? Okay. I'm kind of surprised. Okay. Because... The one of the things nowadays um, that a lot of people who are uh, I don't want to say pushing the carnivore diet <laughs> or promoting it, let's say a lot of people who are promoting carnivorous diets for humans like to say that oh, there's all these anti nutrients in plants that are harming you. Okay, so this is what is what you want to know about it. So these so-called anti-nutrients are compounds, and I say so-called because I'll get to more information about them, um, are compounds found in plants that exist to protect the plant against bacterial infections and from being, being eaten by insects. They're found mostly in beans, nuts, seeds, leafy greens, whole grains, tea, beets, soy, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes. They can interfere with the absorption of calcium, iron, zinc, phosphorus, and magnesium. And, but they can typically be removed or deactivated by soaking, sprouting, or boiling foods before they're eaten. This, like I said, is used as a reason for why people shouldn't be eating plants. Uh, and some examples are phytates, lectins, and oxalates. Has anyone heard of those? Okay. Good. All right. Okay, so let's go over phytates really quick. Okay, so the more you consume phytates, the more your microbiome, the bacteria in your gut, can degrade phytates. Studies have found that vegetarians' intestinal microbes can degrade up to 100% of phytates. Okay, so right there, phytates are probably not a problem for them. Um, the degradation of phytates actually creates inositol phosphates, which are important for intracellular signaling pathways in your body. Phytates actually can reduce cancer risk through antioxidant properties and enhancing natural killer cell activity. Natural killer cells kill cancer cells. 
Um, they have therapeutic uses against diabetes, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, and they can reduce kidney stone formation and uh, protect against heavy metal toxicity. The mechanism for reducing heavy metal toxicity, I thought this was really fascinating. So one of the complaints that people have against phytates is that they can interfere with calcium absorption because they bind to calcium. But the study found that when phytate binds to calcium, that resulting compound can bind cadmium and lead. Whereas on its own, neither phytate nor calcium can do that. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, when you, if you have any issues with absorbing magnesium, um, because let's say phytates could interfere with that, um, your kidneys will actually excrete less magnesium. It's that smart. It'll say, okay, we're not getting as much. Let's stop excreting as much magnesium. Let's put it back into the bloodstream. So it's unlikely to cause magnesium deficiency. Let's look at lectins. Foods with higher levels of lectins are typically also high in fiber, vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients in general. They have anti-tumor, antiviral, antimicrobial, antifungal, and antiparasitic effects, which, you know, don't hear about these things when people are talking about phytates and lectins and oxalates and all that. Um, they are immunomodulatory and enhance your immune system during infections. They are critical, actually. They helped optimize, they help to optimize your gut microbiome and your bacterial flora. Um, they may be effective at reducing blood sugar levels in diabetes as well. Though some in inhibit inflammation, some can induce in inflammation via pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is not necessarily an, a bad thing overall because when you have an issue that needs to be addressed, sometimes that's why the inflammation is there your immune system is going to try to correct an issue and that's where the inflammation comes from. You actually don't, unless you have a physical injury, which actually does, the immune system does um, activate in order to heal that as well. But the, the reason why you have inflammation is because your immune system is doing something. It has been activated to fix an issue typically. So, um, raw beans do have a very high lectin content and should be properly soaked um, and cooked in order to eliminate any health effects to the gut. But that is typically what everyone does with beans anyway. So let's look at oxalates. Okay, so oxalates is like the worst offender of the anti-nutrients, okay? They can, like oxalate consumption can lead to kidney stone formation upon binding to calcium and creating calcium oxalate crystals. However, there's a lot more that's going on when it comes to people who create stones and why they create stones, what other underlying issues that they also have going on, not just their oxalate intake. Stone formers do not harbor the oxalate degrading bacteria oxalobacter and they exhibit gut dysbiosis, which is the disruption of your microbiome, including the depletion of beneficial species like lactobacillus in their urinary tract. Oxalobacter is sensitive to a wide variety of antibiotics, including azithromycin, cipro, clindamycin, gentamicin, levofloxacin, and more. How many people are taking these antibiotics? A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So once you take a course of antibiotics for 10 days or whatever, mm -hmm. how long do you take to build back up? Or do you build back up? Right. Okay, so the question was, when you take a course of antibiotics for 10 days or more or so, how long does it take for your beneficial bacteria to kind of build back up? So it can take quite a long time, depending on the species of bacteria that we're talking about. So, um, one of the things, actually on the next slide, I'm going to okay. touch on that, but in general, it does depend on what you eat. It can definitely depend on what you eat, and obviously taking probiotics can help, taking them short term, all of that. So, um, 
and right here, so chances of colonization with oxalobacter increases with time since antibiotic use, like you, we were just saying, um, and oxalate consumption. But the cumulative use of antibiotics for two months or more and poor hydration both independently increase your risk of kidney stones. Okay. Stone formers also tend to have higher salt intake and animal protein intake, lower calcium and lower fruit and veggie intake. High sodium intake actually increases urinary excretion of calcium, so that's the mechanism there, which can lead to the formation of kidney stones. Consumption of animal products raises your renal, which is your kidneys, acid load, which also increases urinary excretion of calcium because the body uses calcium to tightly control our pH level in our blood and in our tissues. So when we are eating a lot of acid forming foods, our, our bodies will even pull calcium from our bones to neutralize that extra acid. And then that can cause calcification all over our bodies actually, not just kidney stones. So higher intake of, yes. People are asking if these are gluten free. Yes. <laughs> They are gluten free. Yeah. So the if you guys are curious, you can always go back there. Um, I do have the recipes and ingredients back there that you can you can take a picture of and keep it and everything. So okay, so um, but yeah, higher intake of beans can be protective against stone formation. Fruit juices may have positive effects in modulating lipogenesis, which is stone formation, and improving microbiome diversity, which we know now stone formers have an impacted gut microbiome. And in plants, this is fascinating to me, oxalic acid, which is oxalates, acts as a metal chelator, meaning it, it can bind to aluminum in the soil that when the plant is taking up aluminum from the soil, it can bind to aluminum and maintain the health and integrity of the cells by kind of neutralizing it rather than having it impact the plant growth and health. Okay, I didn't get to it. I was telling you I was gonna get to it, but let me just, so there was a study that was done on oxalates in particular, and it did show that if you had taken antibiotics, that it, it takes, gosh, the people who had taken antibiotics within the first year, very few had oxalobacter after a year. Then they looked at people who it had been two years and five years since they had antibiotics and then even 10 years, I think. And by, by I think like the 10 year mark, they finally, like 35% had oxalobacter, which is kind of low, but we don't know Again, we don't know what these people, what their diets are like. We don't know what else is going on inside of their microbiome. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had a course of antibiotics for probably 10 years now. But, well, yes. Yes. And so, I'm hoping... <laughs> You know, but yeah, I mean, right, I know. Unfortunately, doctors kind of give out antibiotics to kids all the time for everything, even viral ear infections and things like that. So, which chiropractic is awesome for, by the way. <laughs> That's how I got into taking my kids to the chiropractor is my daughter had ear infections and I didn't want to deal with giving her antibiotics anymore. And I took her to the chiropractor and totally resolved on its own. And that's what I kept doing. And I never had to give her antibiotics again. So that's just, you know, awesome thing. So uh, moving on. Okay. So what about all that fruit sugar? You know, sugar is sugar, glucose, processed sugar. No, Unfortunately, even though a lot of people like to say, gosh, you're eating so much sugar when you eat all that fruit. It's just not the same thing. Eating fruit is not equivalent to eating processed sugar, pure fructose, or other carbohydrates. There's a lot of studies um, that isolate fructose from fruit um, or evaluate high-carb diets and their effects on the body. And unfortunately, you know, if these 
studies are not evaluating people eating whole fruits, then it's just not representative of what's actually happening when you eat fruit um, versus, you know, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, processed sugar, um, or other carbs that are starches like rice and bread. I mean, there's a lot of people who do high carb diets that are not eating much fruit at all. So, um, fruits and fruit juices contain antioxidants, phytonutrients, bioflavonoids, vitamins, minerals, and fiber. And like I said, even some amino acids. So there's a lot more to fruit than just the sugar, of course. Um, and the soluble fiber in fruits is excellent at slowing down the absorption of the natural sugars in fruit, which can improve the stability of your blood sugar levels. Um, and actually, it increases your insulin sensitivity, meaning you don't have to have as many issues with your blood sugar sharply rising and falling. Um, and it also helps with your composition of your microbiota. It increases your serum antioxidant activity and it protects against DNA strand breaks. However, if you're going to be eating a lot of fruit, you want to just be careful to not get too many excess fatty acids in your diet or, and it's best to not combine fatty um, fats and your fruits because you will absorb the fats first and that can affect the um, absorption of those sugars. Okay, so my conclusion here is the human species is likely to be primarily fruit giverous with omnivorous tendencies. The human body can adapt over time and generations to better process and absorb whatever nutrients are in the foods that you consistently eat due to changes in our DNA expression, like I said, and the shift in your microbiome. So each person has a different... Um, different kind of ancestry here, you know, people grew up in Alaska with their ancestors living in Alaska versus living in Mexico, you know, it's just, we will have different ability to process different foods. However, going back to what is most ideal for the human species and what we were naturally biologically designed to eat will offer the greatest health benefits. So this is kind of just, I'm going to talk about juicing in a little bit, but I wanted to talk about, a lot of people ask, you know, what do you eat? What kind of meals do you eat? Um, you guys got a couple of things that I, I eat sometimes today, the lentil soup and the, um, the salad. But in general, I do eat lots of fresh fruit, fruit smoothies, big leafy green salads with lots of stuff in them. Um, a moderate amount of nuts and seeds. I do love cashews and they have a lot of phytates in them. And I'm like, I'm like, go phytates. So that's kind of my, my perspective on that. Um, I do love veggies and veggie soups. I don't really like raw veggies as much. So I usually do the veggie soups, potatoes, quinoa. Um, like I said, quinoa is a, a complete protein and lesser amounts of beans, rice, corn, and then some once in a while I will eat eggs or fish. <clears throat> so a typical day for me is I wake up in the morning, I have some water, but I will eat like a big bowl of grapes. Grapes are like my favorite fruit because they are just ready to go. You just wash them and they're just, they're awesome. Um, yes. I actually am not, uh, I don't use any special washes. We do have a filtration system on our water, but I don't use any special washes on my fruit or foods, on my produce. So maybe I'm, maybe that I should be. Organic I do because... buy organic typically, but um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, I mean, even so, I've never washed my fruit or produce with anything special other than water but I've been able to heal like everything that I mentioned previously. So, yeah. So um, after that, mm -hmm. I might have a fruit smoothie. And so something that my husband actually loves to do is make a peanut butter and jelly smoothie. <laughs> Sounds really funny, but it's actually really good. Frozen cherries with dates, or you can add a little maple syrup if you want it a little sweeter with some peanut butter or peanut butter powder if you would not want the fat, and just water and ice. And my kids love it. 
it's really good. Um, it's very filling and yeah, it's actually, it's just really good. It's like a dessert. So, and then middle of the day, I usually eat a huge leafy green salad. And I mean like, like a big leafy green salad. Mm -hmm. Um, you have this yes. back there too? Um, your schedule and what you eat. And the oh, I don't have it back there. I don't have this back there, but I could always get it to you somehow if you would like that. Um, yeah, just let me know after. Um, yeah, so I won't go through exactly what I put in my salads, but it's really good. It's really good. I got this salad recipe basically from, have you ever been to Subway and had an Italian BMT sandwich? Anybody? Okay. That used to be my favorite <laughs> sandwich before I stopped eating gluten and salami and all of that. Um, and when I was pregnant with my first, um, I was so nauseous that my husband would drive over to Subway and buy me an Italian BMT sandwich. And I would eat that within like 10 minutes of waking just to fill my stomach up enough so that I wouldn't want to throw up later. So, so I made this salad because I was like, dang, I really want to get those flavors. I want to make like, like a big salad that just tastes like that sandwich. And this is like, oh, so good. So because I, I take the mushrooms and I chop them up with Italian seasonings and fennel and all that. And it kind of has that salami flavor and it's really good. Anyway, so then like for snacks, I'm, and this is when I'm, I should have said this, this is when I'm eat, eating mostly raw. And I will do that from time to time. I kind of fluctuate with my diet when it comes to how much um, like cooked foods that I will eat. Um, but again, so this is when I'm eating mostly raw. I have one, the next one is when I'm not really worried about that. Um, and then for dinner, I might have these raw zucchini noodles. It's this really cool um, device where you just twist the zucchini and it makes little noodles. Um, and I usually eat that with a creamy sauce that I make that's kind of like lightly cheesy and you can blend, if you have a good blender, you can blend up cashews or macadamia nuts with raw pumpkin seeds or hemp hearts. I throw some fresh celery in there, some fresh carrots, onion powder, garlic granules, salt and pepper, and it's super good. And it's, it's nice and complex flavor. It's really good. Or I might have another salad. And then at night, I like to have a dessert, guys. Like I'm not... I'm not depriving myself on this diet. I refuse to deprive myself. Um, it is a lot of food, but when you, that's the one thing to know is that when you do go plant-based, a lot of people are like, gosh, my stomach feels empty. Like I need, I need something in there, you know? And because meat actually takes a lot longer to digest in the gut. And so it will sit there. And like I said, your, your digestive tract is not moving it along. And so you have to eat other foods to push it along. But you always have something in your gut almost all the time when you eat meat regularly, like every day, because it can take a full day to actually completely digest the meat. So, um, do you need to start doing that anytime no, soon? I don't know what time we're at here. Okay. So, um, have you talked about I'm not just yet. I'm almost there. It's like the next. Okay. Okay. Um, so. But yeah, I was going to say, when you jump to a plant-based diet, you do need to eat more. You do need to eat more calories more regularly because, I mean, it's just, it. you burn through the food a lot faster. You can digest it a lot faster. Um, and the other thing about it is that you get used to not feeling so full all the time and you feel lighter and it gets, it feels really good after a while. You feel like, dang, I have more energy. Like I feel feel good. So, and then at night, so this smoothie, um, you, I, I'd like to do like a, a little frozen margarita sometimes with just straw, frozen strawberries, dates, and lime juice, or I'll add basil to it. It's really, really good. Or, well, there's no alcohol in it. I just like to call it, we call my kids call it a little margarita. Can you make this margarita? <laughs> I probably shouldn't do that, but it's funny. So, or I will do like a chocolate shake and it's so good. It's so good. Um, raw cashews, dates or pure maple syrup, depending on how thick you want the shake to be. 
and then I put cacao, cacao powder in it. And then you don't have to do this, but I found this recipe where you could take the date seeds and roast them and then grind them up like coffee grounds. And you can actually make date seed coffee, which I thought was fascinating because my husband was trying to quit coffee for a really long time. And I kept trying to find substitutes for him and see, try this, try that, try this. And it actually works pretty well. It's surprisingly good um, if you're trying to get away from caffeine, for one thing. Um, but I add that to my chocolate smoothie because Gordon Ramsay and all the other kids on you know, his shows I always add coffee to all of their chocolate stuff because it enhances the chocolate flavor. And it's just so good, guys. It's like one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. No. No, I stopped doing coffee when I was pregnant with my first. I did a lot of coffee in college just to kind of yeah. <laughs> survive college. So this is a typical day for me when I'm not, you know, doing as much um, raw foods. So, but I will start the day off the same. I like to... <clears throat> do break fast, okay, I like to break my overnight fast with fruit because it's the easiest to digest, it's hydrating, it hydrates you on a cellular level rather than like water can often just go right through you, okay. And then I will have a, fro a, a smoothie too, I typically do, my kids love smoothies so I'll do that for them. And this one is really good using blueberries and, and chocolate together, it's a really nice flavor. Um, I have a couple other salad recipes that I love to do, but as a snack, I do really love fresh salsa and chips. I just, it's one of my favorite things. My mom loves fresh salsa and chips, so guess what? I got the DNA that she, you know. I don't know if I missed it. But yes. Yeah, it's lovely. I love that stuff, but I haven't found a healthy chip that's good for you that tastes as good as I know. Does. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Like, yeah. Where did you get a good I know. I know. I know. I agree with you. There was a long time that I tried to do the um, the grain free chips, and they're not bad. The lime ones are actually really good. I think they're pretty good. Um, but there's just you can't really compare it to like a corn tortilla chip that's done really well. So I hear you. But I did cut out corn from my diet for a while. And, but now that I am doing so much better than I was years ago, I'm like eating the corn chips. So <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I love salsa and chips or sometimes hummus with some, or homemade dips. I will use cashews and hemp hearts and blend them with um, like taco seasonings and then use carrots and bell peppers and dip that. It's really good. Um, I'm all about the dips and dressings, guys. It makes plant-based meals so much better. Um, and then for dinner, I'll do like a veggie soup. I make this potato soup that is so hearty and, and awesome. You use mushroom broth to give it kind of like a more meaty flavor without the meat. And lots of garlic, celery, carrots, potato. It's just really delicious. And then sometimes I make nachos. And I make my own cheese out of cashews again. Okay, cashews are interesting because they're actually the fruit of the tree. They are never really raw because there's some special treatments, not treatments, but some things that need to be done in order to take the outer covering off of the cashew nut, I think, because there's some toxic, the outer shell or something is toxic. But, um, and so they have to like heat it really quick, I think, to get it off. So it's not like 100% raw, but they're like mostly raw. But it's interesting because cashews are a more softer nut in general. And they're technically, like I said, a fruit. But I eat a lot of them. And so I'm trying to justify that to you guys right now, basically. <laughs> I think they're awesome. But I will say that when it comes to things like eating a lot more cashews in your diet or a lot more like the raw zucchini noodles, your gut is going to need some time to adjust to that. Okay. Because, you know, you're used to eating all these different foods. You're not used to eating higher amounts of cashews or even raw zucchini ever, right? Your gut can be adapted to doing that and it can be fine doing that. I mean, we weren't really supposed to cook our food, like I said. I mean, the most healing we get is from eating more raw foods when it comes down to it. But... Yeah, in the beginning when I ate a little bit of zucchini noodles, I'm like, mm, I don't know if that really sat like super well. It just kind of had a little bit of discomfort. But then eating a couple more times, it was like, oh, okay, I'm adapted now. 
And the same thing with cashews, I think, if people don't regularly eat them as much. A lot of people do soak their cashews to get rid of the phytates, and so that's another way that you can maybe help your body adjust a little better to something like that. But I use cashews a lot because I used to love dairy, okay? Cashews are an amazing substitute for dairy. And yeah, I won't go into why dairy is not the best. But as you can see here, at night, sometimes my family, we watch some movies or shows together, and I love popcorn. I mean, I just, like, I'm, who doesn't like popcorn? There are not very many people, right? So, again, I'm not about depriving myself of good food. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Okay, so here's some of my salads. I get proud of myself with my big salads because I'm like, it looks good. I love it. Um, and then... You make a fast food restaurant that's I know that. you right? Oh my gosh. That's what we need. And my kids they always say I need to I need to have a restaurant. They always tell me that because they're like your food is better than everybody else's that we you know. Anyway. And it'd be available to people. Right. I mean unfortunately the stuff that's quick and easy and cheap. It doesn't die. You know, it's not yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, and then here are some of my other meals. Sometimes I have, that's the strawberry margarita thing over there. And the middle and the bottom is, uh, we used to do these fruit bowls, and we just haven't done them as much lately, but it's a chopped banana. You can chop up apples as well, and you can sprinkle cinnamon on it. You can put a little bit of honey and um, the cacao nibs to give it like a crunch. They're super good. Um, and that's one way that we got our kids to eat more fruit, making it into a dessert when it's actually really all healthy stuff is pretty awesome. And that's my goal, like make food taste amazing and make it out of the most healthiest things that you can come up with and never feel guilty about eating and then just get healthier and healthier as time goes on. Uh, banana one in the middle? Yes. Yeah, that's the one I was just mentioning. Sorry, what was it? Oh, so chopped bananas, chopped apples. And so super basic, right? Bananas and apples. And then cinnamon or pumpkin pie spice, something like that. And then uh, cacao nibs. And there might be some strawberries in there too. But sometimes we put blueberries in there. Sometimes We used to get uh, canned coconut milk and mix it with pure maple syrup, which is probably not the best. I just told you, don't mix fats and sugar. But if you want like a real treat, that is a pretty decent treat. But careful with that. <laughs> so, and then those, that's my nachos right there. And that's my potato soup. So good. Over on the right hand corner, that's um, basically like white sauce, pasta, mac and cheese type of um, pasta. It's really, really good. Um, there's so many different ways to make it. The first time that I ever made it, I found a recipe where you, you cook potatoes, carrots, and onions. And then you put that in a blender with cashews, salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder. Blend it up. It gets like this cheesy texture. It's like amazing and really good on pasta. Really good on the zucchini noodles if you want to do that. Um, yeah. And then in the top middle is um, some spring rolls. I never started doing spring rolls until I went plant-based. That's the other thing that has actually been a really huge blessing for my family um, when we went plant-based and we had to cut all of these other things out of our diets, we kind of discovered all of these awesome recipes and I started exploring more with how to make this or that. And now I'm like, I've got all these recipes now that we all love and they're all healthy and it's been really great for our family. But there's the sauce up there with those spring rolls, the spring rolls, the wraps are like rice, rice wraps, um, but just veggies in there and then the sauce is made of like almond butter and gosh, a little bit of pure maple syrup, ginger, garlic, lime juice, uh, coconut aminos, salt, pepper. It's really, it's a nice kind of a sweet, salty, savory sauce. It's super good. Yes. <laughs> I have some of them. I actually do have a telegram channel that is recipe channel. Um, yeah, I know. I wish I had like a PDF. Maybe one of these days I'll try to make one. But but yeah, so. All right, so now we're into juicing. Hopefully we're not. Okay. I don't know how long you guys are planning on staying. Yes? Um, just, um, 
quick question. When you do the doodles with your socks that you're talking about, mm -hmm. do you heat it up like real fast it or you're just heating it for So when you, if you're going to make the sauce, I don't heat up the, the noodles themselves or the zoodles, but when I make the sauce, the blender actually creates heat. And so it makes it warm enough to where it's like, it's actually really nice. And it tastes like it was recently cooked. Um, um, I'll just talk louder. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, I think so. Does they have? Do we have any other allergies to nuts? Uh, you can do almonds. Almonds. No cashews or anything like that. Okay. What about um, hemp hearts? Yeah. Okay, that's sometimes a good one that you can use for sauces and things. They're a little bit more salty, savory flavored. Cashews are a little bit on the sweet side. So they're more um, flexible or. What's the word? Huh? Favor? Yeah, it's just, yeah, you can use them in more things. Um, gosh, I can't think of the word right now. But yeah, there are, you can use coconut milk. No, he can't, coconut milk is, okay. Okay, that's good. So coconut is a good, good one for substituting dairy sometimes, hemp hearts. Um, what about pumpkin seeds? Yeah, any seeds. Okay, good. Surprisingly, pumpkin seeds, when you blend them, they it gives things kind of a cheesy texture flavor. It's so strange or creamy. Yeah, so it's a lot of things you find out when you start blending things up. But you would need a good blender. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go on to juicing and juice fasting. Uh-oh, did this thing die? Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, so let's look at the benefits of juicing. You probably already know the benefits of juicing are pretty much the benefits of eating vegetables and fruits and leafy greens and herbs. Um, just all the nutrients that you can get from vegetables, which are powerhouses of nutrients, but removing the insoluble fiber that takes energy and resources from us to digest without having to do that. So you're getting flooded with nutrients but not having to expend that energy to digest and process those nutrients. It makes all those nutrients a lot more bioavailable. And I like to call green juice nature's multivitamin and much better than a processed packaged multivitamin. Not the fiber for there is still a little bit of fiber in the juice. Yeah. You don't really need. Yeah. What was your question? Well, it was similar. It's if you remove the fiber, which helps slow the blood sugar spike, mm -hmm. um, is juicing, are you, are you more prone to blood sugar fluctuations as opposed to eating whole, whole fruit? Yes. Yes. So definitely the question was, are you more prone to having more blood sugar fluctuations because you're removing the fiber? Yes. You're not removing all of the fiber. So there is still some fiber in juice that you, you know, juice at home if you're not straining it through like a cheesecloth or something like that. Um, the juice that we're making tonight is just greens. No fruit. Apple. I just have the green apple, which is very little glycemic index uh, increase. Of, but like if you have fruit juice, it is good. Yeah, especially for people who do have sensitivity to that or are more prone to that, of course. I have, I don't seem to have any issue with my blood sugar. And so um, many, and I started juicing when I was not healthy. <laughs> um, I started incorporating it into my daily routine in the mornings. So it's, yeah, you want to be careful of that when it comes to juicing, just in general, if you are susceptible to having high blood sugar, period, when it comes to juicing. But there is so many benefits that you can get from juicing based on, like I said, just giving your body all of those nutrients without having to um, break down that food. And then at the same time, um, gosh, what I was going to say just went poof out of my brain. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> oh man, I just haven't been getting enough sleep lately. That's the problem. Okay. 
So, so have you, you ever have one of those like times in your life where like things are scheduled right on top of each other and you just didn't know that was going to happen and then everything just and you're like oh my gosh I got to do this I got to do that I got to do this I got to do that. that's what happened to me the last two weeks so that's why oh I bet I bet I'm not e I wouldn't be surprised okay yeah you're like Wonder Woman over here okay so um but that's why it's called juice fasting because you're kind of simulating a fasting state. You're not really putting your digestive system through the ropes to go through all of that processing and breaking down and all of that. Um, green juices, because of all the veggie content, are anti-genotoxic. They have a protective effect against reactive oxygen species and therefore oxidative damage to the cellular membranes in all of your cells which all of that can lead to cancer eventually. Um, I thought this was fascinating and it, I'm not surprised at all. I've seen studies like this before, but green juice, which contains carotenoids, the plant-based form of vitamin A, which is an antioxidant, it was more effective at reversing DNA damage than isolated carotenoids. Why? Because, you know, we have, there's all these other enzymes and cofactors and things in the food itself that help to absorb, help to make things work properly, um, all of that. And so when you take an, an isolated multivitamin, um, you're just not getting the benefits that you would if you, would, if you were juicing. Um, and then the chlorophyll in the plants and in all green juices actually improves wound healing, is antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and protects against DNA mutation and carcinogens. Mm, here we go. Okay. Uh, beetroot carrot juice is protective against kidney impairment and an has anti-cancer and anti-leukemic effects. Celery juice and beetroot juice are effective at reducing hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Um, beetroot juice and red spinach juice was found to help improve anemia. And the green tart apple juice, which is what's going to be in your juice, uh, contains malic acid, which is effective at chelating aluminum from the body and increasing the excretion of that aluminum via your kidneys. So that's pretty awesome. And ginger and turmeric are both kind of powerhouse herbs. They're uh, ginger's antibacterial, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. I mean, there's so many things that ginger can do for your health. And turmeric is pretty much the same way. It also induces glutathione. Oh, is that turmeric? Awesome. And it also, oh, and ginger. And awesome. Cilantro. Oh, cilantro. All right. Yeah. And lemon. Okay. Yes. And so turmeric, one thing I wanted to mention is it induces glutathione synth synthesis and glutathione is our mm -hmm. major antioxidant in our body, detoxifies as much as we can. Um, it's, it's, it's important for everything, for wound healing, for infections, uh, everything, for even mounting a proper fever. You need glutathione. So, uh oh, what did I do? Did I turn it off? <laughs> Where's George? George. Oh, wait, there it is. Okay. <laughs> I got it figured out. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. It makes everything work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so some juicing tips if you're wanting to get into it. Um, ideally, using a slow masticating juicer at home, which mimics how our mouths would actually chew the food, and drinking that juice within the first 24 to uh, 72 hours, about three days, is best for preserving and obtaining the most nutrients from your juice. You want to get a juicer, if you're going to get one, you want to get one that makes juicing easy enough for you to want to invest your time into it. The best juicer to buy is the one you will use. Okay. Local places that sell fresh pressed organic juices like Boise Juice Co. or Clean Juice are probably the next best option. They are going to be more expensive than you just doing it at home though. Um, and then organic juices from the grocery stores, they do provide some nutrition. If you're unable to get them elsewhere or it's too costly for you to, you know, get a juicer or go to Boise Juice Co. Um, but they, the store-bought juices definitely are pasteurized because they're on the shelf longer. And so that heat can 
um, reduce enzyme activity and chlorophyll levels and just nutrients in the food in general or in the juice. <clears throat> okay. More juicing tips, obviously use as much organic produce as possible. You don't really want um, pesticides, herbicides that get into the actual food itself, the produce, to get into your juice. Using lemon or cucumber is a great way to help neutralize bitter flavors and increase hydration without adding a lot of sugar to your juices. Um, and combining leafy greens and vitamin C rich fruits like oranges, pineapple, or lemon helps improve iron absorption. So if you're worried about not getting enough iron because you, you're used to eating a lot of red meat or whatever, um, leafy greens are good for that, but you want to get the vitamin C with it to help it make it more bioavailable. Cabbage, purple carrot, orange, apple, and celery juices are actually helpful for ulcerative colitis. And ginger can help eliminate low-level systemic pathogenic infections, which are often the root cause behind low vitamin D levels. I can go on, on vitamin D all day, but I will just leave it at that. Um, and the best way to begin juicing, if you've never done it before, is to include about 16 to 24 ounces of fresh juice. I'll go on to vitamin D. So definitely you need to have the Make sure you get it from the sun, yes. but even the food you eat will create its own vitamin D and store it. <laughs> and But you, you can get it from the sun all summer long and your body stores it. So yes. you can, you can yeah. tap in on that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't want to go off for too long. But yeah, um, vitamin D is important, but in 2010 they raised the level at which you were considered sufficient. And then they started selling a lot of vitamin D uh, supplements. There's a lot more behind that, but they don't measure for the active level or the active vitamin D, the form. They only measure for the storage form and they don't measure, you know, all that you store in your adipose tissue. They can't measure that. Like what you were saying, we store it in our fat cells. So anyway, I will stop there, <laughs> but okay. So yeah. Include it in the mornings. If you're going to start juicing, you want to start incorporating this into your diet. I wouldn't do any drastic changes with your diet in, um, from the get-go. It's always best to go slow, and I'll touch on that later. But um, including it in the morning, right after, like after you wake up, so that it's the first thing you're going to eat on an empty stomach, so that you can kind of more utilize that better and not have other foods in your stomach already digesting and doing other things. Uh, it's the best way to improve absorption of those nutrients okay all right so juicers okay there is a guy that has been doing a youtube channel for a really long time and his channel is called discountjuicers.com and he literally goes through and reviews and compares all different types of juicers i mean he's got videos like on every juicer that is out there and he talks about, you know, pros and cons and all of the above. Super helpful. And also he has a website which badly needs to be updated, but he sells juicers as well. And they are basically the lowest price that you can get anywhere. And, but it's legit. I mean, you go to this website and you're like, this can't be a legit website. Like, I don't trust this website with my money, but in this case, you actually can. So, um, my husband has bought juicers for me from his site. So, so I would definitely recommend going there, writing that down, taking a screenshot if you're interested in doing juicing. So you got to find a balance between the price of the juicer, the preservation of the nutrients, how much work must be done to use it. Like, do you have to chop your celery? How, how small do you have to chop your celery? Um, do you have to chop carrots and kale before adding them to your shoot? And how quickly does it make the juice? How much juice is extracted? You can tell by how dry the pulp is. Um, and then how easy is the machine to take apart and clean? You're not gonna wanna juice if it takes forever to try to take this thing apart and clean it every time you do it. So yeah, the price of juicers can range from about $150 to even $600 and higher for more commercial juicers. But you can find some really good ones in the 250 300 to 500 range obviously that's like that's a lot of money um the juicers that i've got 
or like Christmas presents. And these are the three here I've had experience with. They're all really good machines. The Omega J8004 was, I think when I got it, it was $250. And that one is a really good machine, but it doesn't um, extract as much juice as the Kuvings. And then the Kuvings is great, but it takes a lot longer to to do to 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 um, juice than the other one and then the nama j2 is really awesome because there's all these different types of juicers you can actually put a bunch of produce in the top of it and just walk away and it will chop it up for you and spin and it's awesome it makes juicing so much faster so much easier so if you're willing to invest in it get getting something like that can just make a world of difference you gone through so many because you've used them for so many years they break down like no because because i see one and i'm like oh my gosh that would be so awesome and my husband's amazing and he's been getting them for me <laughs> and i've been able to offload to someone else who wants it my old juicer so but there and there's one i haven't tried but this shine sjx is one of the best selling low cost entry level juicers something to look into but as with any juicer, you know, you want to look at the pros and cons. Okay, so this is a documentary that you all should watch on juicing. Have you seen? It's so amazing, right? Yeah, we show it here. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, Super Juice Me is a documentary that got me into juicing. And it's fascinating. You had, the, in the documentary, they go, um, they have eight people who have a combined 22 health conditions. And they all are basically at this facility, this um, place to dedicate their next 28 days to just fresh fruit juice. Now, a lot of them are on medications, a lot of medications, and it just goes through how their bodies are healing, how they react to having this juice. You know, it's a process, but it's pretty incredible and inspiring to watch. So I definitely recommend looking that up. It's free on YouTube to watch under that title, uh, Jason Vale Dash Super Juice Me documentary. Another one is fat, slick, and rarely dead. Mm, it's, yeah. it's a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to share some personal experiences with juicing regularly and juice fasting. So I said at the beginning I was very severely anemic. Two months after I got my own juicer and I started juicing regularly, every day in the morning I was drinking around 24 ounces of juice every morning, first thing. My symptoms associated with severe anemia were completely eliminated. Now I was juicing mostly because, I mean I had a lot of issues, right? But I wasn't super focused on, even I wasn't focused on the um, anemia issue necessarily. I was just trying to get healthy in general. And I had previously taken my iron levels in a blood test. And I was so deficient the year prior that the the lab called me and said, this is, this is really, really low. You know, and I'm like, yeah, I can tell it's really, really low. So, like I said, I remember earlier I was saying I have to bend down like this to get my kids' toys off the ground. There was one day after I started juicing, I just, I just bent down. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't feel like I'm going to pass out anymore. And I was totally shocked. And I ended up taking my blood levels and they were almost totally normalized after two months of juicing. I didn't have, never took an iron supplement. And doctors always say, oh, just take an iron supplement. What they don't tell you, and maybe they don't know, is that when you have chronic illness, chronic illness or iron deficiency or anemia of chronic illness is very different than just not getting enough iron in your diet. Anemia of chronic illness is you have low level pathogenic bacterial infections in your body and your body's trying to pull iron out of your blood because the iron helps proliferate bacterial infections. The bacteria actually feed on the iron. And so in order to prevent the proliferation of that infection, it pulls iron into cells. Okay, and so then you feel anemic even though your cells are full of iron. And the, the iron being in your cells can become toxic to your cells and cause all kinds of damage. 
And so what do doctors do? Take an iron supplement, which might help you feel better temporarily, but totally makes things worse. So, so much worse. So I was juicing a bunch of leafy greens, uh, cucumber, celery, beets, carrots, um, a lot of ginger and lemon. And it, I mean, it was, it was incredible what it did for me. My first three day juice fast, I had mentioned before I had this chest pain upon wakening. I couldn't wake up. I struggled with that immensely. The, like I said, my first time ever doing a juice fast where I was eat, drinking and eating just juice. The third morning I woke up at like 7 a.m. I didn't feel the chest pain anymore. I felt really good. I had energy. I felt well rested. And I literally woke up and I was like, what time is it? Why am I awake? I was like, what is happening right now? And I have never felt that since that day or the day before that. I've never felt that chest pain. I've always, ever since then, been able to wake up early now. I don't struggle to get out of bed. I don't feel sluggish in the mornings. Whatever it did, it was like miraculous for me. And then another three day juice fast I had, I've had really bad shin splints my whole life. I was very athletic as a kid. Um, ever since then, I mean, walking for long periods of time, I would get really bad pain in my shins. And one night on a juice fast, my shins were on fire. I was like, what's happening? My immune system was going to work on my shins, you guys. It was nuts. Ever since then, never had any pain in my shins. No matter how long I walk for, I can go all day at Disneyland and I'm still fine. No pain at all. So that was really awesome. All right, moving on. We're going to uh, bring them to the next. We're going to be doing a cancer talk here um, this year. And so it's just one of those things that, again, God put amazing nutrients in this food. But are we willing to do this? And so my challenge to you, I know she's going to so wrap this up, is that are you willing to heal? <clears throat> I think expectancy is a, is a seed of certainty. And you have to be certain that, that God heals you, but you also have to act on it. And when my son got the diabetes, I heard Daniel's fast. And that means vegetables yeah. and water. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And so I said, okay, God, if you say that and I just dove in and we just dove in and so if you really want to heal from something juicing and a plant-based diet is the way to go but if you are just not ready yet because guess what you have September October and probably well if you don't join in the Halloween we don't do Halloween <laughs> yet. but you know what I mean but yeah September October and most of November to, to do this stuff to heal because once November comes in December, it's, it's, it's called, it's, it's over. I mean, you can still do it, <laughs> but it's a lot harder to do something like this. But I would challenge you that you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do a three-day uh, fast. I, mean, I can't do probably 10 or 14, but I'm going to just try three. Mm -hmm. And then you just, you know, find it. And the 1st of October, I'm going to do this and see how it goes. I don't know. I'm probably going to feel, and you're going to feel actually... Uh, if you've never done this, guys, you're not going to feel too good the first three days yeah. uh, because your body's still craving a lot of, you know, but after like day four, day five, if you choose to day, day five, it gets so easy. And then later, it's just like you don't even, you know, your taste buds like crave this stuff. So I will also say that, um, and I'm not sure where you stand on this, but I've done... Also, like uh, last October, I did a four-week fruit and juice fast, yes. and it was incredible. I was still doing. I do taekwondo twice a week my, with my kids. My kids do it, and then I do it. And I was able to do all of that, even though I was doing just like just fruit and juice, and I felt amazing. Um, some people do do their first fruit um, or juice fast. Like my brother-in-law decided he was going to try it one time, and he felt he's like, I feel amazing. Um, so it's each person might be a little bit different. Sometimes it takes more time to really dig into some of the more chronic issues that you have and you might feel really good at first but then you do another juice fast later and you're like Ooh, I'm really moving stuff around like your immune system is really working on stuff this time and you might not feel as awesome the second time you do it or whatever. But um, so I'm going to start this machine okay. so we can get this going. Yeah sorry about that. 
Um, I just wanted to share my blood work that I did over the years. I haven't done it since then because I've been feeling fine and it's, things have been good. Um, plus COVID happened. I didn't really want to do it then. So uh, 2015, things were not good, guys. This was my anemia of chronic illness. That's what that was, okay? And then 2016, I didn't test for um, my iron levels, but I, this is this TPO antibodies, that is my Hashimoto's thyroid autoimmunity. So TPO is thyroid peroxidase, and then AB is antibodies. So, um, but in 2017, I did this in July, I believe, is when I took my blood. And it was February of that year is when I bought a juicer and I started juicing. And so in like April is when I started feeling like I didn't have any symptoms anymore. And I just waited until July to test because I had been testing in the summer every year. Um, but you can see like it even is reflected on my blood work that even though I didn't have to take iron supplements or anything like that, I can actually show that, wow, juicing corrected this issue for me and I have it on record. So, um, so yeah. And then let's see what else. I don't have too much left. I just want to share some of my favorite juices. If you guys wanted to take a screenshot of this or anything, um, when I was first doing a lot of juices, I did a variety of juices, but I think, like I said, the thing that really, really helped me with my iron levels was doing this veggie one, the leafy greens the, with the beets and the ginger together are really powerful. Beets are kind of a, um, I want to say a more advanced um, veggie to juice just because they're they're very powerful they can detox you um, their nutrients in them can be very detoxifying so just a heads up on that you do a little bit of beet and see how you do and then you can do some more um, the orange one is really delicious and um, the cabbage one like I said the cabbage is good for ulcerative colitis and then this harvest one is just fun in the fall because you can add pumpkin to it and it tastes like fall. <laughs> so, but okay, ultimately guys, you really want to do slow changes. You don't want to transition too quickly because a lot of times people will, like I say, they'll jump into a vegetarian diet or they'll jump into plant-based or even vegan overnight. And they'll say, oh my gosh, this was inspiring. I'm going to do this, right? Problem is, is like the carnitine from the meat, um, the vitamin A from the meat, and these other things that you get from meat, when you're eating that consistently, it's sending the signal to your body to not produce those things. Don't synthesize this yourself because you're already getting a lot of it from your diet. So if you just cut that off overnight, it's going to take a long time for your body to realize that, oh, we're not going to get this like we normally would. And then you're going to be depleted. A lot of people, if they jump into it, they feel so exhausted, so depleted. Um, it can really affect your energy levels, your sleep, a lot of things. So when I was transitioning to a plant-based diet, I grew up, my dad's a hunter, okay? He goes hunting. I grew up eating meat almost every meal. Um, and so... I was actually pretty resistant to that. I wanted to try paleo. I wanted to try other things before giving up that and going to fruits and vegetables. And I hated salad, you guys. I forgot about saying that, but I hated salad. Even up until 2017, 2018, I, you would not see me eating a salad, okay? I would try to eat anything but that. So... It's amazing that I eat as much salad as I do now, but I've made it taste really good. Did you have a question? Yeah, you know how it, what would you say compared to budget? Like, I mean, honestly, meat is pretty expensive comparatively. Yeah. yeah. You can do a lot um, with, like, romaine lettuce, like a bunch of romaine lettuce. 
is I mean, you can go to the a restaurant and pay a lot of money for a salad you know with like two strawberries cut up or whatever that they put on the salad right versus at home you can make a giant bowl of salad of the whole head of lettuce that costs you I mean in a package nowadays it's like $3.99 for three um, romaine hearts or whatever so I mean I like even just one of those is a lot for me to eat and I'll add some tomatoes to it and other things but it's super filling and that's it's not a lot of money at all you can make it definitely budget friendly organic is obviously more expensive but there's a lot of people who have healed on plant-based diets without having to go all organic it's just definitely something that you know if you can try to do that did you have a question yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> okay so yeah when it comes to especially your gut microbiome I forgot to say that it needs time to slowly transition because your gut all your little bacteria in your gut are saying okay we are eating this way now when we have all these new foods coming in we're gonna have to adjust how we're processing this and what kinds of things we're gonna produce now and the, the flora and the diversity and everything's gonna have to shift a little bit okay and sometimes if like I said you know you're putting in a lot of phytates or the lectins your body's gonna say Oof, this is a little too much for me right now I need to build that up so well, that's one reason to go slow the other is your kidney health okay kidneys are basically like the garbage duct of the body you, you excrete all your waste and toxicity out through your kidneys and if your kidneys are overwhelmed sometimes they will push that toxicity out through the skin you might get rashes um, and you don't want to overwhelm your kidneys so if you are going from even just like a processed food diet to like let me do whole food high fruit I mean it's that could be overwhelming for your kidneys because you're you can be triggering triggering your immune system to act when your organs are not up to speed with how much toxicity is going to be flowing to them in order to process that out of the body if that does that make sense so um, and then again your lymphatic system kind of needs hydration in order to flow and get drain all of your organs to get it down to the kidneys and get the waste out and you know sometimes people can that can get backed up and it can become very stagnant so you want and, and fruit is really good for getting that flowing and getting that hydrating so if you were to like jump into a fruit fast or jump into a juice fast then again that can overwhelm your kidneys your energy needs and dependency I mentioned that with the carnitine and all of that and also just in general um, going slow helps you to um, avoid detox and elimination reactions so like the rashes or any pain sometimes if your your body wants to detox it really wants to pull it's hard to explain this but if your immune system is really working to try to get rid of toxicity but your lymphatic system is not flowing and it can't get to your kidneys to get it out you can experience pressure and pain sometimes headaches and things like that and so going slow helps to avoid any kinds of symptoms you might have of your immune system kicking into gear before other systems and organs are ready for that kind of action if that makes sense dry, what do you do with this stuff oh um well sometimes we feed it to the deer <laughs> or the chickens you can feed it to a lot of people. okay so but yeah well, you do get a lot of deer which is pretty awesome um, or you can make crackers with it you know a lot of people will make get a dehydrator and they'll make crackers with their pulp but it, it's kind of a lot of work and I'm not that kind of person so <laughs> I mean I've gotten used to doing a lot of specific things but putting cashews in a blender with some water is pretty easy you know when you're throwing stuff in there versus you know preparing some pulp and then getting it flattened out and getting it into a dehydrator for 20 hours it seems like you know it's another level that I'm just but not there chicken. yeah That'd chickens awesome. other animals yeah, yeah. so um, oh I just want to throw this up there hopefully it makes sense 
this is kind of what I'm talking about when it comes to your immune system kind of kicking into gear with your body not being ready. On this suppression side here, you might not have any symptoms, but that doesn't mean you're healthy. Okay, sometimes you can have underlying issues, but you don't really feel what's going on because your immune system is not activating to do anything about it. Once you start juicing, once you start alleviating the burden on your digestive tract, giving your body more energy to, to detox and focus on healing and regeneration and repair, um, you're going to start detoxifying. But, and, and because of that, your symptoms might increase because your elimination through your kidneys is not up to speed yet. It's not, it's impaired, okay? So you might have symptoms increase for a while as you're still accumulating as time goes on because you're not getting rid of it yet, but your, your body's like, let's go, let's go, let's detoxify. Once you hit a certain point where your kidneys are starting to function better and especially, guys, exercise and sweating, you actually have heavy metals in your sweat and that's your body getting rid of toxicity. It's awesome. Incredible. Um, so exercise is really good for lowering that toxic body burden and that can reduce the load on your kidneys as well. So that's another way of helping that process, helping to eliminate the toxicity. And so once you get better excretion and elimination, you start to have lessening of symptoms and you start to make your way to real health. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but it's one reason why certain diets actually send you this direction. They send you towards suppression. Because like I said before, protein actually impairs your kidney function. High protein diets can prevent your kidneys from excreting waste. It will reroute it back into your bloodstream. And what does that do? It actually starts to settle back into and around your organs and tissues. Okay. And so your immune system's like, we can't do this. We got to focus on digestion. Our body needs to focus on digestion constantly. And so when you sleep, it's actually a time of fasting. And if you have food in there, your body's not able to do the regenerative processes like every night you should be able to do some regeneration and repair as you sleep. If you've got food in there, it's going to have to focus on the digestion. It's not giving your body time to rest. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but certain diets send you this way to eliminate symptoms. And that's not really helping your body to heal and repair. It can help you feel better. They can sometimes help you feel better, which, you know, is a, is, has positive, you know, benefits in and of itself. If you have chronic pain and it helps get rid of your pain and you can function better, that's great. But underneath it all, your organs and tissues are weakening. So anyway, that's why the plant-based diet and going back to what uh, is most natural for the human species is best. It makes the most sense because you can then purge all of that. What do you guys think of that? The juice. Good. 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 Yeah. Good. Good. Did, you, did you feel Good. like a zing in there? Yeah. That's the ginger. Yeah. And all the active enzymes that are Can like. I have a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That are like activating your. Um, so, but if you're really, really, really mm. acidic, meaning that your body is so used to bread, pasta, all the processed foods, you're going to hate the taste of it. When you start alkalizing your body, you just, you crave this stuff, mm. like you want it. That's true. But you'll see that as you start to get used to your body changing its internal environment, it's addictive. It's yeah. very true because my brother-in-law, who like would swear he never ate a vegetable in his entire life because he, he hates vegetables and just would never eat them, he started going to Boise Juice because he didn't want to get a juicer, but he started going to Boise Juice and drinking their Holy Kale juice. Mm -hmm. And that one's pretty potent yeah. for a juice. It's still pretty sweet, much sweeter than this, but it's pretty potent. And for him at first, he was like, Ugh, like, you know, choking it down. <laughs> and uh, it's so funny because after a few months, he was like, I crave that stuff. I crave it. Yeah. 
and it's really fascinating how your taste buds can change and adapt because when I was juicing in the beginning yeah, yeah. I'm gonna let you finish I I'm gotta go so adjust a little boy that needs help yes um but just a reminder get her vaccine guide like she's it's amazing like well, you can go online and get it though she makes binders but you can get online it's amazing the information you have on that but also if you are if you are coming to the dinner please turn this in tonight you can keep the flyer to remind you but turn this in and that's october 24th and if you do want to get checked fill this in and give it to one of my uh, team members and um thank you i'm gonna go yeah 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 so, for yeah. sure i only have one slide left you guys well, you're, uh, so you didn't say that this stuff all your little other things we try were excellent. were they good oh i'm so oh, yeah. glad did you guys all like them okay did you like this now good yay the they are back there go ahead and take a picture of all the recipes for sure um so i just wanted to leave you with this i've got like eight pages of re um sources after this that's all it is but our health issues are kind of blessings in disguise at least for me it was you could either Go the Western medical route, try to suppress your symptoms, not deal with it, continue to eat junk, or you can totally transform your life, get healthy, feel amazing, help your fam family and friends heal, like feed them amazing food that can help open their eyes to healthier ways of eating. I mean, I've, I've made like healthy cheesecake, you guys. I mean, you can make cheesecake out of coconut milk coconut oil cashews uh maple syrup lemon juice and a little bit of salt that's cheap like cheesecake in a blender you pour it in like you know you can grind up some nuts and 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 dates and make a crust out of that okay and you pour that blend into there put it in your fridge it's so awesome my dad who like i said is a hunter and he loves his dairy he makes fresh real ice cream out of you know, heavy cream every year um, for holidays and stuff. He had the cheesecake and he was blown away. And normally he's like, what's in that? Gross, you know? <laughs> so I've been able to convert a lot of my family members to be like, ah, it's pretty good. Um, so I know that it, it, you know, when you think about cutting out some of the foods that you love, you don't have to cut it all out completely. Cutting back is definitely a really good thing but just opening yourself up to other foods and and making healthier recipes and and trying to find stuff that you really enjoy it's out there okay it doesn't have to taste like junk it can be so so good so, site that has generally pretty good recipes? I wish I could tell you no. that I do no. um, I have just kind of gleaned from all over yeah, and I've I've made my own recipes and I've come up with a lot of different stuff. I mean, I've made like buffalo cauliflower wings at one point and they were pretty good, but it's a lot. That's a long process, so I just don't do that. I try to make things easy, quick, taste really good. Um, yeah. So, but I am actually very thankful for my health issues because of this, because it opened my eyes to all this stuff for my kids. So, anyway. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for coming. I hope that it was educational, helpful. You can always come up and talk to me if you have any questions or anything. Thank you. Sources. Boom. Here we go. Sources. 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 Sources.